to 1 Samuel, because we need to cover a couple of things here. And there's um, a couple, couple of points that need to be addressed. So go back to 1 Samuel chapter 11. We skipped 1 Samuel chapter 11. Because when I planned sermons through 1 Samuel, I went through 1 Samuel 9. And then when we came back today, we went to 1 Samuel 12. Uh, we skipped 10 and 11, which is related to confirming Saul as king. And we've got a couple of things here to, to look at. First of all, there are a couple of paragraphs that are not in Scripture that are helpful for understanding this. Now what we have in the book of 1 Samuel, we base our English Bible translations on the handed down Hebrew text that is what the same thing that the rabbis use in the synagogues and on and on and on. And I firmly believe that everything we have is all that we actually need for obeying what God has for us to say and for what God has for us to do. That Scripture is inspired, it is perfect, and we're not lacking anything that we need to follow Jesus in it. There are some spaces, though, that you go, um, a little more information would be helpful. In 1 Samuel chapter 11, we actually have a couple of paragraphs that are present in the Dead Sea Scrolls copies of 1 Samuel that are not in the received Hebrew text. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls are things that a big deal was made of in the 1940s when they were found initially in a cave beside the Dead Sea, and they are some of the oldest, physically oldest, copies of some of the Old Testament books that we have. One of the great things that was discovered, for example, they found a complete scroll of Isaiah which is huge. <laughs> and the, the Bible museum that they built in Israel to hold many of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they have a replica of it, and it's, it's at the ceiling, and it's like this big all the way around. It takes up basically an entire room. And when you compare that Isaiah, that physically they can date it to about 200 B.C. or so, or you know, somewhere in that range, it is almost completely identical with the exception of a few grammar, basically a few weird grammar moments, to Isaiah as it is in the received Hebrew text that your Bible is ba was based on initially. So it, it helps show that the text was transmitted properly and, and that God preserved that, which is a great thing to know. Okay? That, that is a great thing to know. But we find in 1 Samuel, we find an addition, and it comes right before 1 Samuel 11, and it's a couple of paragraphs that say that at this time, Nahash the Ammonite was going around in the towns of Israel that were on the west side of the Jordan River, and he would lay siege to a city, and if they would surrender to him, he would make a treaty with them. And, but if he did, he got to gouge out everybody's right eye. And he had been doing this to all the towns on that side of the river. Now remember why we've got towns on that side of the river. It goes all the way back to as the people of Israel are coming into the land, the tribes of Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh say, we really like this side of the river, we'd like to stay over here. And so they do. But they've now got a physical barrier between them and the rest of the people. And they're separated. So Nahash is over there and he's causing a great deal of trouble. Now why would you gouge out their right eyes? Well, first of all, because then everybody walks around with their eye gouged out and you get to kind of say, look at me, I'm special. I'm in charge. My people are the ones with two good eyes. It's embarrassing. It's painful. Don't kid yourselves. We have not invented anesthetics yet at this point. You're talking 3,000 years ago. The idea of you know, anesthetic was very simple. They hit you in the head with something big and heavy to hopefully knock you out so that it hurt. that hurt a little less than whatever they did to you next if they did it. On top of that, it makes you very militarily a little bit screwed up because you have no depth perception. God made you to need two eyes. Because that's how you see depth. If you have one eye that doesn't work or is missing, then your brain can do some work with that to help you learn to develop depth from it. But if you don't have both of them, it's very, very hard. 
If you don't have but one eye, it's hard for you to drive well. This is why I'm convinced that Nahash the Ammonite at some point conquered the city of Memphis. <laughs> because most of the people there drive like they got no death reception. But, so, so you have that as well. You're not going to be a very effective archer. And again, it's, it's a shame. It's an insult. And you'll live with it the rest, you know, the rest of your days. Plus, it'll shorten your lifespan because it's going to be a traumatic injury to your body. And you don't have any medication to overcome that. And this event seems to be part of what drives the people of Israel to demand a king because they want a king to go lead them into battle against Nahash. So Nahash comes and he surrounds the city of Jabesh Gilead and says, Hey, this is what I'm going to do to you. And they say, Well, give us, give us a week and we'll see if anybody will come fight you. And if not, we'll make a treaty with you and we'll give up our right eye. And that's what you start chapter, chapter 11 with. So they come to Gibeah where Saul is. They report the matter in the ears of the people. And the people all weep. Saul's coming in from the field behind the oxen. He's been anointed king, but he's still out plowing. And Saul says, what is wrong with you people that you're weeping? They told him the news of the men of Jabesh Gilead. And the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul when he heard these words. And his anger was greatly kindled. Sometimes the Spirit of God drives us to be angry at wickedness and evil in this world. And that is a fully appropriate and correct response. Back when I was a teenager, no, I guess it was when I was a youth minister, the big vogue were these bracelets and t-shirts and they had WWJD on them for what would Jesus do? I know they were around when I was a youth minister. They may have been around when I was a teenager too. And people were reading Charles Sheldon's book, In His Steps, which is a good book, and asking that question, you know, well, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Keep in mind that sometimes the answer to the question, what would Jesus do, is fashion a whip out of cords and drive out the people who are behaving wrongly in the presence of Almighty God and harming people. Jesus doesn't always walk up and give you a hug and say, it's going to be all right. Sometimes he says, go forth and sin no more. And sometimes he makes a whip and goes after the people that are wicked. The Spirit of God is not... The spirit of happiness and calmness and serenity and, and peacefulness. Sometimes the spirit of God is the spirit of righteous indignation and anger at evil that is bad, that God wants destroyed. And that's what comes upon Saul at this point. What's wrong with these people that they're weeping? Well, there's wickedness to be dealt with. So he takes a yoke of oxen, cuts them in pieces, sends them throughout the territory of Israel by the hand of messengers, saying, Whoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. Tough on the cows, folks. That's tough on the cows. Then um, the dread of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out as one man. When he mustered them at Bezek, the people of Israel were 300,000, the men of Judah 30,000. Do the math, it's probably 330,000 people. Either that or it's... 300,000 of whom, 30,000 are from Judah. Uh, you can argue with Old Testament scholars about that next week if you want to. And they said to the messengers who had come, Thus you shall say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow by the time the sun is hot, you shall have salvation. Messengers came and told the men of Jabesh they were glad. Therefore the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we'll give ourselves up to you. They say this to Nahash the Ammonite, I guess to get him to calm down. And you may do to us whatever seems good to you. The next day Saul put the people in three companies. They came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch and struck down the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. And I love that picture. You know, that's how scattered they are. They are all alone in this world. And the people of God are together. So pick up what that should mean for us. It is a sign of defeat and loss before God if we are scattered where there are none of us left together at all. The people come out as one man. They deliver the city of Jabesh Gilead. The thing I want you to take home most from this, though, is, is, is the need to respond we spend a lot of time 
weeping over stuff. It's a terrible thing that happened, and we weep. There was this decision, and it was immoral, and it was wrong, and so we weep. And there was that decision, and it was wrong, and so we weep. And there was this bad thing that happened, and so we weep. And there is a time for that. After all, Solomon pointed that out. There's a time for this and a time for that. But there comes a point that the right way to look at the question is what is wrong with these people if all they're going to do is weep? If the numbers are accurate and if the text is right, they're accurate. And if God said the text is right, then we're going to agree with God, right? Because arguing with God is a foolish position to take. They have 300,000 people in the army of Israel. The Ammonites don't have an army that size. They don't. They're, they're not that big at that stage in history. They could have whooped them. Half of them could have stayed home and they would have been able to defeat the Ammonites. There comes a point that what's wrong with us is we sit around and weep and we don't do anything. We weep over the condition of the fallen world, fallen world that we live in, but we don't tell people about Jesus. We weep over the condi spiritual conditions of our families, of our churches, and yet we don't hit our knees in prayer. We weep over the fact that, they're, that the next generation is, is vanishing away from things and yet we do not engage and involve them and raise them up and teach them the ways to walk after Jesus like we ought to. We weep over the condition of people's marriages in our churches and yet we do nothing to strengthen them. We weep over divisions in church and yet we're the ones that plant our flags and say, if they're going to solve the division, it's real simple. Everybody come over here to my side. We weep over the pol political choices we get in this country, and yet what do we do? Well, we go ahead and start casting stones just like everybody else does. We get down in the mud and waller with them. And then we wonder why it's all pig slop. We look at situations and say, well, somebody ought to do something. And I'm going to sit here and I'm going to point out that somebody ought to do something about that. And frequently we got two good hands and two good feet, two good eyes, reasonably good eyes, reasonably good ears. By the way, if you want to work, if working with children and youth, which is something that needs to be done, it's not a bad thing to be half deaf. <laughs> You're going to be when you get done anyway. You might as well start that way. It makes it easier. Somebody ought to do something about this. And we can go home, watch Dancing with the Stars, and wonder why nobody's willing to make time to help. Folks, if you got time to watch Dancing with the Stars, you got time to help. Trust me, because you got time to watch nonsense. Now, if all you do is go home and watch documentaries, it's another story. No. We sit around and we weep over this and we weep over that and why oh, and get up and get to it. Don't make the Lord cut up your oxen to help you realize that you're supposed to be doing it. Realize what that would have done. Because that probably, if Saul's out plowing with the oxen, we mentioned this this morning. Their farming seasons are very simple. You know, now is the time to do this. It's time to plow. And if it was time to plow in Gibeah, it was time to plow all over the rest of Israel. Most of the men in Israel would have been involved in doing the exact same thing Saul was doing. Saul's saying, look, if you don't make time now, I'm going to guarantee that you've got plenty of time later. Because we're going to cook your oxen. And then you won't have anything to harvest because you won't be able to plow. Make some time now. And see what the Lord does in the future. And through that power, the Spirit of the Lord works through the people. They drive the Ammonites out. They secure 
Jabesh Gilead and most of the towns on the other side of the Jordan. And everybody comes together and says, wait a minute, let's celebrate this. They go to Gilgal, they offer sacrifices, they rejoice before the Lord. Saul pushes forward that they should be forgiving and open to those who had grumped about the fact he had become king. You go back and look, you see, people say, it, you know, it's, it's at the end of chapter, chapter 9, chapter 10, when Saul's anointed king, and some people say, well, I don't see how this guy can be our king, and I love the, Bible, the, the line that goes with that, and they didn't bring him any presents. That's what it says. They didn't bring him any presents. Where is that? That is in, uh, yeah, 1027. Some worthless fellow said, how can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present. <laughs> he held his peace, though. Sometimes when people despise you, the best thing to do is to hold your peace and then show them that they are wrong. Not rub it in their face, but simply live out by your actions that this is what, we, what you are. And then, when other people want to go rub it for you, just say, no, let's celebrate what God has done. Because Saul's statement, and this is probably the high point of Saul's spiritual life as king of Israel. He points that it's the Lord who's brought salvation. And he says, let's celebrate that and leave the rest of this alone. It's a time to set the personalities aside and the arguments aside and say, let's celebrate what God is doing, what God has done, and what God is going to do. And let's rejoice greatly, for it's the Lord who works salvation for us all. So let's remember that going into this coming week, going into this summer.